Roderick and Mark Newell grew up living a very privileged life within a seemingly perfect family. Generational wealth, a private education, a plethora of luxurious holidays and what many would consider an exceptionally easy life. However, for one of the brothers, this was not enough. In October 1987, Nicholas and Elizabeth Newell vanished into thin air and it would take five years, an undercover sting operation and an international manhunt for investigators to finally uncover what happened to the couple. Hello lovelies, I'm True Crime Caitlin and welcome to my channel and another True Crime Case. Thank you so much for being here with me. If you're interested in true crime, please make sure to subscribe because that's what this channel is all about. You can also click the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new true crime case. I just want to quickly apologise that it's took us so long to get this video out over on Instagram and TikTok. You were all messaging and DMing and commenting, when is the next YouTube video going out? and I'm so sorry that I've not been able to give you all a date but we're here now so yeah thank you for your patience. As you can hear I am a little bit sick, I do have a little bit of a cold slash flu, a bit of a stuffy nose and stuff but that's okay, we're going to power through today so I'm sorry if my voice kind of changes and goes in and out as we're talking through the video but we're just going to jump straight in today. Before watching please make sure to check the description box below for my disclaimer and for any content warnings. Today I'm going to be telling you all about a case that captured the nation, a case that everyone knew about, everyone was talking about, everyone had their own theories and opinions on and a case that even today almost 36 years later has many unanswered questions. I'm True Crime Caitlin and this is the murder of Nicholas and Elizabeth Newell. In the early 1960s, Nicholas and Elizabeth met when they were both working as teachers at New Park School in Fife, Scotland. And when they met, they totally hit it off. They had an instant spark. And for them, it was pretty much love at first sight. Elizabeth was in her early 20s and Nicholas was in his early 30s. There was a nine year age gap between the couple, but that didn't bother them at all. They were compatible, they had a lot in common, and most importantly, they were in love. To be honest, when describing these, in love is probably a massive understatement they were absolutely besotted with each other. Nicholas came from a wealthy family who had a lot of old money. They had worked in shipbuilding and I believe that Nicholas was one of the first in the family to not go down this route and get into teaching instead. Because of his family wealth he was able to attend the best boarding school, he got a brilliant education and he went on to attend St Andrews University where the Prince and Princess of Wales would both later attend. Really quick side note, but when I was on St Andrews University website, they listed as one of their previous alumni as Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of America and the man that's on the $100 note. He got an honorary degree from there in 1759. And I know that's not relevant to this case, but when I was researching and I found that, I thought that was super interesting. So I thought that you would as well. Some people would describe Nicholas as very entitled, that he thought very high of himself and very low of other people. He genuinely believed that because he had a lot of money, he was better than people who had less than him. He could be snobby, he could be stuck up and a bit rude, you know, if he was out and about at like a restaurant or something, he would be rude to the waiter or waitress and not think anything of it. And anyone that he considered below him had to address him as Mr. Newell or he wouldn't be happy. Of course, he had a lot of friends as well. He was very intelligent and he would spend a lot of time in different social circles. So it seemed that for people he considered lower than him, he wasn't a very nice person, but to everyone else, people he considered on his own level. He was nice so I guess he could kind of be two different people. Elizabeth's early life pretty much mirrored Nicholas's. She came from a family of farmers who over time had built up a fortune and after the death of her parents she inherited a good sum of money. She also attended boarding school and would also go on to attend St Andrews University, of course a little bit later than Nicholas had. Elizabeth was a social butterfly and she was described as jolly and a person who liked to have a good time. She was really into sports, she liked playing cricket, golf and tennis and she was very competitive, maybe even a little bit unhealthily competitive. She always wanted to be on the best team and she wanted to be the winner and she'd take it bad if she wasn't. Despite her jolly and happy front, Elizabeth had quite a fiery temper inside. Nicholas and Elizabeth married in 1963 and together they lived a life of luxury. 
one thing about these two is you know that saying live every day like it's your last these two really did they were here for a good time and always lived in the moment the couple wanted to make the most of their life so they would spend and spend and spend and didn't really consider watching their spending they were very much living in the now they loved sailing so they bought a yacht and they would go everywhere on it they loved going to spain so they bought a villa there they would frequently host and attend parties they spent a lot of time with friends either having drinks or going to dinner and they spent all of their time together they came as a package so if you invited Elizabeth somewhere Nicholas was going to come as well and this wasn't even in like an obsessive or possessive way they just genuinely loved experiencing life together and doing everything together which I think that's beautiful really for a lot of people that is all they want they want to find their soulmate and do everything together and be happy and stupidly in love and Nicholas and Elizabeth were very lucky they had found that with each other. In 1965 Elizabeth gave birth to her first child a son who she named Roderick and the following year in 1966 she had her second son and final child who she named Mark. I say her child and her son very deliberately because Nicholas did not want children. Initially when Elizabeth had proposed the idea of starting a family to Nicholas he was like nah he was dead against it he did not want kids however after some persuasion he reluctantly agreed but he made it very clear that he wasn't the one who wanted the kids it was Elizabeth so everything basically was down to her looking after them raising them everything that was all down to Elizabeth the Newells had planned to go on a really big, long, extravagant holiday in 1967. They had planned to sail on their yacht all around the West Indies before docking in the Caribbean. However, not long after they left Scotland, Mark, who again is the younger son, turned really, really ill. He was being sick and he was having blackouts, so the Newells had to intercept their journey to the West Indies to get Mark in front of a doctor. And this is how they ended up in Jersey, one of the Channel Islands. It didn't take Nicholas and Elizabeth long to completely fall in love with Jersey and I don't blame them because Jersey looks absolutely gorgeous. They decided this is where they want to live, this is where they want to raise their sons, surrounded by sandy beaches and stunning views. They purchased an extravagant mansion called Crow's Nest in the St. Owen area, which was amazing. It was perched on top of a hill, giving them amazing views of the small beach Greve de Lec. By 1968, the Newells had comfortably settled into their new home. Nicholas continued teaching at nearby St. Michael's Prep School. He taught English and history, and despite being described as very authoritative and stern, he was all round very well liked by his pupils. Elizabeth was more of a casual worker. She was working as a supply teacher, so kind of just picked up jobs every now and then, and the boys absolutely loved their new home. Here in Jersey, everyone was happy and life appeared to be sheer bliss. However, despite how things appeared on the outside, things inside the home were quite different. As I mentioned earlier, Elizabeth could have a bit of a fiery temper and Nicholas was quite an emotionally absent father. But the main thing that really bothered Roderick and Mark, the thing that they so desperately wanted and needed from their parents was affection. It seemed that all the love that Nicholas and Elizabeth had, they gave solely to each other. Elizabeth was more concerned with being a perfect wife for Nicholas than she was at being a mother for her children, which is really bizarre considering and how much she wanted these children. I'm sorry if I'm going to word this really oddly but in their home there was a family of four people however they weren't like a family unit it was sort of Nicholas and Elizabeth and then Roderick and Mark as two separate units I know I'm probably explaining that really really complicated. A family friend would later describe their dynamic same quote. They treated their sons so coldly that if you had treated your dog like that, you would be reported to the RSPCA. I don't think the boys ever had a kiss or cuddle from their parents all their life. The brothers became more detached from their parents when aged six and seven, they were shipped off to boarding school in England. In all fairness, Nicholas and Elizabeth did want the best for their sons and they really valued education. So they believed that in order for their sons to get the very best start in life and for them to thrive in adulthood was to send them off to this really expensive boarding school. To Nicholas and Elizabeth, this was a very normal thing that didn't really take much consideration. 
they both had went to boarding school and by all accounts they were living a great life doing well for themselves and they wanted the same for their sons to be able to live that way off of their own backs. Roderick and Mark attended Lockers Park Prep School in Hemel Hempstead which was about £30,000 per year to attend and again there's two of them so Nicholas and Elizabeth are spending about 60 grand a year on their son's education more than the average yearly salary of someone in the UK. Roderick and Mark hated boarding school. They absolutely despised it. They thought that their parents had just shipped them off to get rid of them. They felt left out, they felt excluded, and they felt unloved by Nicholas and Elizabeth. Over time, this anger manifested in a deep-rooted resentment and genuine hatred towards their parents, and naturally, because they were at this boarding school, they felt distant from their parents. While they were at boarding school, it was noted just how different the two boys were. Roderick was a very popular Jack the Lad. He was cheeky, he liked to show off, he got lots of welcome attention from girls, he was very much a ladies' man. He was hot-headed and he could snap or get angry at the most minute things. He was once excluded from the school after he was involved in a fist fight on the roof of the building and during this exclusion, he spent time dealing drugs. Not much is ever really said about Mark apart from how quiet he is. He wasn't loud and boisterous like his older brother. He was very quiet and he was an introvert. One of his close friends would later describe him saying that he wouldn't even say boo to a goose. Mark kept his friendship circle very small. I think that during his time in school and at the college it was just kind of him and then this other friend that always stuck together. This friend who later spoke on a documentary commented on the strained relationship that Roderick and Mark had and he said that Mark was even scared of Roderick because of his anger and his temper and that the brothers had butted heads before in the past. While their sons were away at boarding school, Nicholas and Elizabeth would take full advantage of this free time. At this period, they were very rarely in Jersey. They were so often either in Spain in their villa or out sailing on their yacht. In fact, they were away from home so often that it became a normal sort of expected thing for them to be away at Christmas. See, the couple would buy Roderick and Mark's presents months in advance and then they'd wrap them up and hide them, stash them around the house. And on Christmas morning, they would literally text one of the boys and be like, Merry Christmas, gifts are in the cupboard or gifts are in the drawer or wherever they'd hidden them. That was it. Whenever Roderick and Mark were broken up from school for like a half term or Easter or anything like that, more often than not, they were looked after by Elizabeth's sister, who was a woman named Nancy Clark. The boys had lovingly nicknamed Nancy Nan, so when talking about her through the video, I will be calling her Nan. Nan, who I believe still lived in Scotland, would travel down to watch the boys in Crow's Nest, so at least if their parents weren't there to look after them, they could be in their own home. Nan would be be one of the closest things that Roderick and Mark would have considered a, a mother figure and they really deeply loved and appreciated her. On the odd occasion when Nan couldn't watch the boys they would be watched by their uncle Stephen who is Nicholas's brother who's actually his identical twin so they developed a really nice bond with their uncle Stephen as well. After leaving school both Roderick and Mark decided that they didn't want to go to university much to the disappointment of their parents. Throughout their academic life the brothers had immense pressure put on them by their parents to excel within their studies and I mean they weren't geniuses, they were just regular students, nothing outstanding or remarkable, just normal which is perfectly okay. They hated boarding school and as someone who also hated school I can understand in the not being bothered and not caring mentality that they had. They hated it there and they weren't going to stress out and put loads of effort in to try and reach these unrealistically high expectations set for them by their parents. So when Roderick and Mark finished their education with just normal, good results, Nicholas and Elizabeth weren't happy. They were ashamed and felt let down and now Roderick and Mark are both deciding that they don't want to go to university. Their parents are disappointed and they're very open in letting their sons know that they're disappointed which can't feel good for any children especially when these children already think that the parents don't like them or love them. It mustn't feel nice at all and if anything this just sort of added more fuel to the fire for the hatred and dislike that Roderick and Mark felt towards Nicholas and Elizabeth. 
Mark would go on to do really well for himself. He started working in high finance at one of the banks in Jersey and he was really good at his job. He was intelligent and what he knew, he knew really well. And one of these things was making money and he began to make a lot. Colleagues would describe Mark saying that he was a workaholic. He was always the first in the office on the morning, last out on a night. He steadily climbed the corporate ladder and he was really happy. He was really chuffed with himself of all the success that his very hard work was rewarding him with. He was eventually able to move out of Crow's Nest and he moved into his own flat in Jersey all by himself with no help from Nicholas and Elizabeth who were extremely proud of him. Mark would begin training to be a Euro bond dealer for an Arab bank and this new job saw him working and living between Jersey, London and Paris and he was absolutely thriving. He was so happy, he loved doing this and he's now raking the money in. He's now earning more than his parents. Outside of his work life, Mark was still very introverted and reserved. He would spend his free time kind of kicking back, laying back, relaxing in his flat. He enjoyed watching films with the takeaway and he bought himself a sports car. He treated himself to this, so he liked going out for drives in that as well. He wasn't isolated though. He did sometimes go out with his friend from school who I mentioned earlier. They would go to the local rugby club and quote, get rowdy. Roderick went down a bit of a different route to his younger brother. He decided that he wanted to join the army. He too worked his way up through the ranks and became a part of the Royal Green Jackets Regiment. Roderick felt like he needed discipline. He needed to go somewhere where someone tells you what to do and then you just do it. That's how some people thrive. Despite this though, his behaviour and attitude didn't really change. People would still consider him very arrogant and aggressive and he was pretty reckless as well. Roderick would abuse drugs while he was on his barracks which obviously is not allowed and if he was caught he could have been put in front of the court martial and probably kicked out of the army but he didn't consider that he wasn't bothered about that but he was never caught anyway, he was really sneaky. Roderick was very careless with his money at a point he was living literally paycheck to paycheck, which was something that he wasn't used to. He thought that he could still live the way he had been when he was living off of his parents' money, off his own, but he couldn't, he couldn't do that, he wasn't making enough. One summer, Roderick was back home in Jersey with a little bit of time off from the army and he approached his mum, Elizabeth, asking if she would help him out with some money. He wanted her to pay his mess bill for the army and I did try to figure out what it was by myself but I'm really no good with army terminology so wasn't having much luck with that so I asked someone who's in the army right now and what he said was that a mess bill is sort of a bill you get from the army for them providing your meals and your accommodation sort of stuff like that so I'm just going to go with what he said that that's what a mess bill is. So Roderick went to his mum asking if she would pay this mess bill for him and probably for the the first time ever she refused. Elizabeth wanted to teach Roderick a lesson to make him learn the value of money, make him realise that he's got to start budgeting better and get better at money handling and that her and Nicholas weren't going to keep giving him these handouts. So probably for the first time ever, she is refusing to help Roderick. He began pressing really good on and on his mom, like, please man, come on mom, help us, that sort of thing. But Elizabeth was firmly holding her ground. She was not going to give Roderick this money. And this made Roderick angry. So this is when he lifted his arm in the air and punched his own mother. He punched his own mother because she refused to give him some money. Sometime after this, I don't believe that it was immediately, but Roderick did apologise to Elizabeth and she accepted the apology and it was sort of left at that. I don't know if Nicholas had any idea that Roderick had punched Elizabeth because from what I could gather, what I read about Nicholas was, I think if he knew that Roderick had punched his own mother, he wouldn't let that anywhere near her again. He wouldn't risk Elizabeth being hurt again so I seem to think that maybe Nicholas didn't know but that's just my assumption. While both Roderick and Mark were working hard making their own money and trying to establish themselves Nicholas and Elizabeth were doing what they always had holidaying, partying, sailing and all around just having a good time, more so now because they had both taken an early retirement. Supposedly Roderick and Mark were really envious of their parents for this. To them it seemed like their parents 
parents were just sailing through life, no pun intended, and they believed that everything was easy for their parents but difficult for them. They were working their backsides off and their parents were out doing this, that and the other. But what Roderick and Mark didn't see or didn't realise was that when Nicholas and Elizabeth were their age, they were doing exactly what Roderick and Mark were doing. They were throwing themselves into work, they were establishing themselves, they were trying to make their own money and because of all that hard work, they were able to do what they are doing now, all the holiday and the party and the sale and everything like that. They weren't able to do all of this solely off of their own wealth and their own inheritance. Their own hard work had contributed to that, but Roderick and Mark didn't see that. I hope that that makes sense because I feel like I just worded that really complicated, but basically Roderick and Mark thought they were doing all the hard work and their parents were doing nothing and they didn't like them for it. Roderick and Mark were aware of their parents' excessive spending and now that they were doing so much, they were actually spending a little bit over their means, thus eating into their son's inheritance without a second thought. So in order to get some more money, Nicholas and Elizabeth decided that it was time to sell their mansion Crow's Nest. Honestly, they weren't in it a whole lot anyways between the house, the yacht and the villa in Spain. They weren't at Crow's Nest a lot. Roderick and Mark had both permanently moved out and with it just being the two of them, they didn't need a great big mansion. They would rather the money so that they could go and spend it and enjoy themselves. So to them, selling up was a no-brainer. Roderick and Mark took the sale of their childhood home very hard. They loved that house and they had many fond childhood memories there. Nicholas and Elizabeth downsized, purchasing a white bungalow at 9 Clos de l'Atlantique in St. Brelade, which was on the other side of Jersey, but it was only a 15 minute drive from Crow's Nest. Their new bungalow was very modest in comparison to anything that they had ever lived in, but honestly, it was perfect for Nicholas and Elizabeth. Sometime in 1986, Mark travelled back to Jersey to alert his parents about something that he had found. Again, Mark worked in banking and he was very switched on in a lot of different aspects and one of these was the different stock and insurance markets. Nicholas and Elizabeth had invested a lot of money into Lloyds of London and Mark predicted that it was going to crash. So he came to Jersey to tell his parents that they needed to withdraw their money, but they didn't. And Mark was right, Lloyds of London did crash. As a result of this crash, Nicholas and Elizabeth had to make annual payments back to Lloyds of London and the way that it worked is that these annual payments was going to completely swallow Roderick and Mark's million pound inheritance. This debt to Lloyds of London would only be cleared after both Nicholas and Elizabeth had died. On the 9th of October 1987, Roderick and Mark both flew back into Jersey in order to start planning a birthday meal for Elizabeth's upcoming 48th birthday. They decided to book a table at the restaurant inside of the Seacrest Hotel. Elizabeth was thrilled that her sons were coming over so she would see them just before her birthday and that they were all going to be spending some quality family time together, which very sparsely happened. She was gushing to all of her friends about how excited she was. According to the documentary Countdown to Murder, the following day on the 10th of October, Roderick had rented a red van which he used to drive into St. Helier, the capital of Jersey. Once here, he went into a hardware shop and he spent just under £104 buying what we in hindsight would call a murder kit. He purchased two spades, two torches, two tarps, a pickaxe, heavy duty plastic bags, a saw, a rope and several cleaning products. See the day before when Roderick and Mark together were planning this birthday dinner for Elizabeth, Roderick wasn't even thinking about the dinner. In his head, he was going over a meticulous plan to murder his parents. In his head, he went over and over the plan until it was refined and perfected. Roderick had fully decided this is what he's going to do. He had made up his mind he was going to kill his parents. So him going to this hardware shop on this morning, that was him doing the first steps of his plan, getting all the items he needed to murder Nicholas and Elizabeth to then dispose of the body and to clean up a crime. 
crime scene. Meanwhile, back at the bungalow, Elizabeth was getting on with a bit of decluttering and cleaning. They had moved from Crow's Nest, this really big mansion, down to a very small-ish bungalow, so there was stuff everywhere, and she needed to clear up space, so Elizabeth was kind of pottering about all the stuff, sorting some stuff into boxes to keep and boxes to get rid of. She also asked Roderick and Mark to go up into the attic and sort out some of their old things as well, so kind of dotted around the bungalow here and there is boxes that's just full of stuff, just full of clutter. That evening, as Nicholas and Elizabeth are getting ready to go out to dinner with their sons and are waiting for their sons to arrive at the bungalow, Nicholas realises that he's accidentally double booked themselves. Elizabeth and one of her friends shared the same birthday and they had all previously planned to go out on this night, the night that Roderick and Mark were wanting to take them out. So Nicholas goes to the phone, he's got full intentions to call up this friend and cancel or rearrange. But when he's on the phone, either he or this friend, I couldn't figure out which one it was, suggested that instead of fully cancelling, why doesn't Nicholas and Elizabeth meet up with these friends before they go out with Roderick and Mark and then have a couple of drinks, that way they can still see their friends and then still go out for this meal with their sons. Nicholas and Elizabeth never wanted to turn down drinks with friends, thought this was a great idea, so they quickly got ready and headed out the door, leaving behind a bottle of champagne for Roderick and Mark to open when they arrived. Mark offered to be the designated driver this evening. He wouldn't have a drink so that everybody else could have a drink and enjoy themselves. However, for some reason, his own car wouldn't work. It wasn't turning on or something like that. So he had to drive the red van that Roderick had rented. This is the van that has the murder kit in the back. It's unknown whether Mark knew that the murder kit was in the back and if he did know what was in the back, what what Roderick had them for if he knew what Roderick's intentions was with these items. The brothers arrived at the bungalow at around 8pm and they were shocked but not surprised to find that it was empty. Of course their parents had gone out before and kind of left them behind. Roderick and Mark could never have Nicholas and Elizabeth all to themselves. Them being left behind while their parents were out having fun or partying, anything like that was just the norm. They'd come to expect this so they felt a little bit foolish to think that this occasion was going to be any different. Nicholas and Elizabeth weren't actually out too much longer. They kind of came in just after Roderick and Mark had arrived and immediately they popped open the champagne. The Nibbles arrived at the Seacrest Hotel for their 9.30pm reservation and throughout their time here they seemed to be just like any other normal family. They were genuinely all really enjoying each other's company. They were all happy and in high spirits which wasn't something that happened often. A waiter would later describe seeing the Newells on this evening and said that they looked like a very close family who were having a good time. Throughout the evening they dined on lobster, they drank through two bottles of expensive champagne and a further three bottles of wine. Now remember Mark isn't drinking so all of that alcohol is being consumed by Nicholas, Elizabeth and Roderick so it's fair to assume that they were pretty drunk. At the end of the evening, Mark took care of the bill. It came to just over £144, which with inflation would be about £390 a day, so a very expensive meal. The Newells then left the Seacrest Hotel at around midnight. Mark dropped his family off back at the bungalow and he pretty much immediately left. I think we've all at least once been the only sober person around a lot of drunk people and it's not the most fun thing so we can relate to Mark wanting to get his family home safely then just go home and go to bed. Not long after she got home, Elizabeth was feeling a bit tired, so she too made her way to bed, leaving Nicholas and Roderick up to continue the celebrations. Nicholas cracked open some of his favourite scotch and him and his oldest son sat and got into a really deep conversation. Nicholas wanted to know what was Roderick's life plans, what were his aspirations, where did he intend his career within the army to go? And this is when Roderick admitted to his father that he actually wanted to leave the army because he wasn't happy there. Upon hearing this, Nicholas blew up. He was absolutely fuming. He had spent thousands of pounds sending Roderick to an amazing school and he blew that, not getting the grades that he and Elizabeth had expected from him. He didn't even try going to university and now here he is wanting to drop out of the only career that he has ever had. Nicholas was seething. In this moment, the son that is standing in front of him is a disappointment and he's a failure and Nicholas is making 
making sure that Roderick knows that he thinks that and it's really hurting Roderick's feels obviously so he is now retaliating. The two men are drunkenly arguing and within this argument for the first time ever Roderick accuses Nicholas of neglecting him throughout his childhood and for a split second the arguing stopped. Nicholas was a very proud man and despite the fact that he didn't really want children he still firmly believed that he was the best possible father to his sons. He showered them in gifts and material objects. They never had to worry where their next meal was coming from or if they had a bed to sleep in that night. They were given an amazing opportunity to get really far ahead in life and up until their adulthood Nicholas along with Elizabeth had funded everything for him so now for Nicholas to hear that Roderick is a accusing him of neglect, he is astounded by how ungrateful Roderick has been. How dare he accuse him of something like neglect? Roderick believed that he was neglected in the sense that he didn't really receive any love, affection or attention from his parents. So he is referring to emotional neglect as opposed to physical neglect. Absolutely irate from this comment, Nicholas told Roderick to get out and demanded him to leave, but Roderick wouldn't. Nicholas then pushed Roderick and caused him to fall to the floor, whacking his head on the way down. Roderick then jumped back up onto his feet and prepared to have a fist fight with his dad. During all of this, the shouting and the commotion of the arguing, it had actually woken up Elizabeth. She sat up in bed and was sort of listening in for a few minutes and then she decided to get up and go and try and intervene, probably try and separate the men and defuse the argument a little bit. So at this very moment, as Elizabeth is getting up out of bed and intending to walk into the living room, Roderick is back up on his feet and he's angry he's seeing red and he is full of adrenaline he looks around and picks up one of the closest things that he considers a weapon which happened to be a pair of nunchucks that would just lay in a random box that was inside the house one that had been sorted out earlier and with these nunchucks he begins to uncontrollably strike his 56 year old dad over and over savagely whacking him in the head again and again until Nicholas fell limp to the floor. It was right at this moment that Elizabeth was entering the sitting room and what she saw was absolutely horrific. Her oldest son, 22 year old Roderick, is towering over his own dad, her beloved husband, and in a frenzy he is beating him with these nunchucks over and over and over and there is just blood splattered everywhere. Roderick turns and he sees his mother and he bolts after her, he shoots after her, chasing terrified Elizabeth into her bedroom, cornering her, once again, lifting up the nunchucks and bludgeoning his mother to death. And just like that, Roderick Newell has murdered both of his parents. As I mentioned earlier, murdering his parents had been the plan all along. However, it wasn't supposed to happen like this. Roderick had carefully, meticulously planned every single step of the murder so that he would be able to conceal it. He intended for it to appear like his parents had jumped on their yacht and gone to Spain because they were supposed to be going to Spain within the next couple of days and his intention was to make it look like they had just disappeared or just never come back. But now he's gone off plan and he's panicked and he doesn't know what to do. His dad's body is lay in the living room, his mum's body is lay in the corner of her bedroom and Roderick is just stood there covered in their blood feeling lost and in a daze. He sat down and rang the only person who he thought would be able to help him, his younger brother Mark. Mark was back at home asleep when his phone began to rang. It was probably not going on about 2am now, so feeling tired and slightly confused, Mark answers the phone. And what he hears is his older brother telling him, I've just killed mum and dad, and if you don't come here right now, I'm going to kill myself as well. And in that moment, Mark was about to make one of the biggest decisions in his life. Was he going to hang up and call the police, turn his brother in and risk his brother potentially taking his own life? Or was he going to travel to the bungalow and help his brother conceal a murder? Mark chose the latter he was going to help his brother. He tried to calm Roderick down on the phone and reassured him that he would be over as quick as he possibly could. When Mark arrived at Nine Clos de la Atlantique, he found his brother sat clutching their father's shotgun. 
Mark took the shotgun away from him, kind of calmed Roderick down and together they got to work. The still warm bodies of Nicholas and Elizabeth were tightly wrapped up in the two tarps that Roderick had purchased earlier at the hardware shop. Their bodies were then loaded into the red van. Roderick and Mark decided that they were going to bury their parents' bodies in some woodlands, kind of out the back of their childhood home at Crow's Nest. Roderick and Mark used to play in these woodlands a lot when they were younger, so they knew where the more secluded areas were, where I had less foot traffic, and where to bury their parents so that their bodies would never be found. The brothers went on to dig up a large ditch. They then dumped the bodies of Nicholas and Elizabeth inside, lying them head to toe. They filled up the ditch and then they fled, knowing they were never going to see their parents again. At some point, the boys did try to incinerate some evidence. They had made up a little bonfire and put a lot of stuff in there, a lot of stuff that also belonged to their parents. This included some blood-soaked clothes, Nicholas's glasses and his pipe, Elizabeth's handbag, and a length of metal and chain, which I believe was part of the nunchuck. This picture shows an inspector holding it in one of his hands. When the boys arrived back at their parents' bungalow, they scrubbed the whole place from top top to bottom for hours, getting rid of every single drop of visible blood and anything else that was incriminating. Because they had scrubbed at the carpet in the living room for so much to get up all of Nicholas's blood, the carpet in that area was soaking wet. So they turned the heating up all the way in the bungalow in hopes that it would dry out the carpet and kind of dry out everywhere as well, because it would look suspicious if someone came over and there's just a big damp patch in the corner. Roderick and Mark had been up all through the night, Roderick murdering his parents and then Mark assisting in concealing the murder and cleaning the crime scene. So they were exhausted and any adrenaline that they were running off had totally gone by the time the sun had rose. That morning, a woman named Maureen arrived at the bungalow and knocked at the door. She and Elizabeth were really, really good friends. So Maureen had turned up with a bouquet of flowers for Elizabeth's upcoming birthday. Roderick answered the door and Maureen was really taken aback by his appearance. He looked absolutely dreadful and she even said to him, you look like you've seen a ghost or you look like death warmed up. Roderick accepted the flowers and told Maureen that Elizabeth was still in bed. They'd been up really late last night, so he would give the flowers to Elizabeth when she had woken up. And Maureen had no reason to question this, so she said thank you, and then off she went. That afternoon, both of the boys hastily left Jersey, Roderick going back to his barracks and Mark returning to London. Four nights after the murder, between the nights of October 15th and October 16th, the Great Storm of 1987 struck the UK, Channel Islands, France, Spain, Norway and Belgium. The Great Storm devastated parts of the UK, Channel Islands and France with very violent hurricane-like winds going up to 135 miles an hour. Schools were closed and people's homes were being damaged, the electricity was cutting off, trees were falling down and it was all around a very terrifying time. The Great Storm tragically caused the death of at least 22 people and it was around this time that people started to notice that they hadn't seen Nicholas and Elizabeth. Prior to this, they had kind of sussed on a little bit. Maureen, for example, had noticed that Elizabeth hadn't called her to thank her for the flowers. Other friends had noticed that Nicholas and Elizabeth hadn't showed up to pre-made plans that they had made before this. And the couple seemed to have gone radio silent, which was very unlike them. They were always a couple that were in touch with their friends. But by the time people were starting to realise this, the great storm had hit. And for a lot of people, that's what their attention diverted to. However, not Maureen's and her husband, David. Maureen asked David to go down to the bungalow to check on Nicholas and Elizabeth to make sure that they were all right, so he did just that. When he arrived at number nine, Clos de la Atlantique, he noticed that there was about five days worth of unopened letters at the door. I think the Newells had like, is it a foyer or like a porch 
like a door you step in and then there's like another door to get into the house that they had one of those and through looking through the window of the porch or foyer he was able to see all of the letters on the floor he could feel the heat that was radiating from inside the bungalow because like i said one of the brothers had turned the heating all the way up in order to dry out the bungalow and they had left it on so this bungalow was red hot sources conflict on who it was that actually contacted the police to report nicholas and elizabeth missing some say that it was david and some say that david contacted roderick and mark who then came to jersey and reported their parents missing Either way, Nicholas and Elizabeth were eventually reported missing and Roderick and Mark were back in Jersey assisting with the missing persons investigation. However, they didn't even look like they were worried about their parents' whereabouts and they had no sense of urgency at all. When police and investigators arrived at the bungalow, nothing seemed out of place. That's how well Roderick and Mark had cleaned up the bungalow. These investigators didn't even know that they were stood in the middle of a crime scene. The detective wanted to speak to Roderick and Mark separately and for some reason these interviews were being done at the bungalow and not up at the station. So the detective sat with Mark to question him first and they sat in the living room where Nicholas had been murdered. It hadn't even been one minute into Mark's questioning when Roderick barged in through the door demanding that he wanted to be there. He interrupted Mark's questioning twice and both times he was told to leave. It was very obvious to everyone there that Roderick was very tense and agitated and seemed really on edge, whereas Mark was the complete opposite. He was very relaxed and sort of nonchalant. From both of their first interviews, their story seemed to match up pretty well. It was a very basic story they'd all been out to dinner they'd came home and then gone to bed over their next few interviews there would be little slip ups and inconsistencies here and there there was actually about 60 different points in their stories where the information they were given was different or contradicted each other so for example if they questioned mark about sleeping arrangements mark would say well i slept on the couch and roderick slept on the bed but if they asked roderick that it would be flipped so roderick Roderick would say that he slept on the couch and then Mark slept on the bed so again lots of little inconsistencies just like these ones. That was just one example. It seemed that they had perfected their very basic story but didn't dive into the finer details. Police continued investigating the missing persons case and they found that Nicholas and Elizabeth's yacht had disappeared however both of their passports were still in the bungalow so it wasn't possible for them to be in their villa in Spain like they were supposed supposed to be at this moment in time if they hadn't been murdered. Searches were conducted all around the island and all along the coastlines with the help of volunteers and dogs. News outlets were broadcasting this case and the investigation constantly given tons of updates and this was national news. Everyone was talking about the Newells, everyone wanted to know where they were, what happened to them and the local people. It was getting a bit scary for them because what had happened to the Newells was something now going to happen to them were they safe or were they in danger as well had something bad happened to the Newells that could possibly now happen to them so there was a lot of anxiety in Jersey at this time Roderick and Mark would both participate in the searches for their parents and Mark would even go on to do a public appeal asking them to come home however his demeanor is very off he just seems very indifferent about the whole thing slowly but surely the investigation into Nicholas and Elizabeth's disappearance began to go cold they had investigated all the leads that they could and none of them led them any closer to the couple the police did they really really did think that Roderick and Mark had something to do with it they were very suspicious of them but there was no evidence pointing towards them doing anything and you can't arrest someone on a hunch or a gut feeling four weeks into the investigation police finally got a break during one of the searches, someone had come across a very small bonfire which looked like it had someone's personal belongings inside and some of these belongings matched things that the Newells would have owned. Remains of a bonfire were discovered near the family home with burnt blood, splattered clothing and other belongings of the Newells. Very interesting, a head from a pipe. And we knew that Mr Newell smoked a pipe. 
these items were sent for analysis and they were able to extract fibers from them and these fibers were a perfect match for the carpet that was in the bungalow. The forensic team arrived at Nine Clos de la Atlantique and they began a full forensic investigation of the bungalow. They started off by ripping up the carpets and that is where they found blood. They would go on to find a significant amount of minute blood splatter. It was so small that it was barely visible to the naked eye it was all up the fireplace it was up the walls it was on the ceiling it was even found in the shower and on shampoo and conditioner bottles where maybe after the murder Roderick had gone to clean himself up of course, investigators believe that they knew exactly who this blood belonged to. However, they needed to prove it 100%. So they went and asked the brothers if they would provide blood samples so that they would be able to prove that this blood belonged to their parents. And shockingly, both of the boys declined. Up until now, they had been pretty cooperative within the investigation. So why now are they retracting their cooperation? Were they maybe worried that some of their blood had got mixed in with their parents? The investigators branched out to other relatives of Nicholas and Elizabeth. And from these relatives, I believe that it was Nan, who again is Elizabeth's sister, and Stephen again, who is Nicholas's brother, provided blood samples. And from these blood samples, they were able to confirm that the blood found in the bungalow belonged to Nicholas and Elizabeth. Nicholas's blood was found in the living room and Elizabeth's was found in the bedroom. This discovery shifted the investigation from a missing persons case to a murder inquiry and police already had two suspects right at the top of their list, Roderick and Mark Newell. When Roderick and Mark were interviewed after this discovery, neither of them really displayed any sort of emotion. They didn't seem upset at the fact that police believed that their parents had potentially been brutally murdered, which I think any other normal person would be hysterical hearing that. Despite best efforts from investigators and detectives, they could just not find any evidence or anything that could implicate Roderick and Mark who weren't given up a thing. They had no idea where the body of Nicholas and Elizabeth were. They were so desperate to try and solve this case that they even enlisted the help of psychics. Maybe they could help in some way, but sadly, despite all of this, they were no closer to finding out what happened to Nicholas and Elizabeth. And ultimately, the case began to go cold. As it does, life continued on. Roderick and Mark got on with their life, police worked on other cases and sadly the people of Jersey started to forget about Nicholas and Elizabeth in their case. On the 3rd of January 1991 the brothers had returned back to Jersey to legally declare both of their parents as deceased. By doing this they were able to claim their million pound inheritance which with inflation would be around 2.7 million pound today. Both of the boys use their newfound wealth in very different ways. Mark himself didn't really change after getting his inheritance. Instead, he was investing it and trying to flip it in order to make more money. It was said that the only difference in Mark after getting this inheritance is when he was flying between his homes in London and Paris, he would fly first class. Roderick, however, completely changed his life. He finally left the army. He bought himself a really nice yacht, which he would spend a lot of time on, traveling all around the Southern Atlantic. He even went to New Zealand at one point. He partied, he had fun, he was living for the moment. He was living his best life. He was essentially doing what he hated his parents for doing. In 1992, he spent six months living in Southern Brazil with his then girlfriend, a woman named Helena Pedor. They did eventually break up and he left Brazil and returned back to the UK. Helena does have a very important part in today's case, so make sure you remember her. Roderick arrived back in the UK in July 1992. He was setting out to upgrade his yacht. He wanted a newer or better one. And he decided that while he was home, he would go and visit some of his family and friends. He'd been away at sea, um, doing a lot of traveling. Then of course he lived in Brazil for six months as well. So he thought that while he was home now, getting a new yacht, this was the perfect opportunity to do his rounds and go and visit everyone. So he started off by going to visit his beloved Andy, Nancy Clark. 
Roderick. Nan and Roderick were sat eating together and Roderick was telling her all about his adventures, all about his traveling, his time in Brazil. And you know when you've been on holiday and you just wanna tell everyone about it? That's what Roderick was doing. At one point during this conversation, Nan does bring up Nicholas and Elizabeth and she says something along the lines of, she'll never understand what happened to them and the why, the not knowing is absolutely break and I just find it hard to live with it. At the mention of his parents, Roderick's face dropped. Despite his demeanour, it did appear that every now and then he would show little glimpses, little hints of guilt and sadness and remorse. So he's blabbering on about how great life's been and how much fun he's been having. Then immediately at the mention of his parents, his face drops and he just becomes sullen. Roderick, I don't know exactly what he said, but he sort of hinted to Nan that he knew what happened to Nicholas and Elizabeth, but he refused to elaborate any further than that. The next person that Roderick was going to visit was his uncle Stephen. Again, Stephen is Nicholas's brother, Nicholas's identical twin. So after Roderick left Nan's, she called the police and she relayed this very weird interaction onto them that she had just had with Roderick. She told police that he refused to speak to her anymore about his parents, but that he was going to visit someone, his uncle Stephen, who he he may potentially speak to. So police contacted Stephen who of course was more than happy to help and aid in discovering and finding out what happened to his brother and sister-in-law. So he agreed to help the police. Stephen and Roderick arranged to meet at the Dunkeld House Hotel in Perthshire, Scotland and they were going to be in a room that was completely kitted out with tons of surveillance equipment. This was a full-on sting operation. Police who were two doors down were going to be listening to every single word of Roderick and Stephen's conversations. I know that I've mentioned it a couple of times that Stephen and Nicholas are identical twins but just imagine this from Roderick's point of view. Like the last image he saw of his dad was when he was bludgeoning him to death and now he's going to be meeting up with his uncle who literally looks exactly like him. Like imagine that. I bet that that really, really hit him the first couple of seconds that he saw his uncle Stephen. The conversation between them started pretty similar to how it had between him and Nan. Roderick spoke to his uncle about his relief after finally leaving the army. He boasted about his extravagant travels and told tons of stories about his time living in Brazil. This went on for a good few hours, but that was fine. Police wanted to make sure that Roderick was comfortable talking. He was kind of laid back, relaxed, and that he wasn't on edge at all. Stephen begins to shift the conversation and he starts asking Roderick questions about Nicholas and Elizabeth. What does he think happened to them? Does he ever miss them? Does he ever think of them? Stephen tells Roderick that he really wants to have a funeral for Nicholas and Elizabeth to allow them to lay at rest and so that he can have somewhere to go in order to mourn them but without the bodies he just can't do it and by now after Stephen has said all of this Roderick is really emotional he's weeping he's literally on the verge of bursting into tears Stephen tells Roderick that he'd spoken to Nan and she said something really strange something that Roderick had said to her and he had asked Roderick what that was all about at the mention of this Roderick sighs and he breaks he begins to relay that whole night under his uncle Stephen in extensive detail, telling Stephen all about the night of the murder, what had happened, what he had done, and how he had disposed of the bodies with the help of an accomplice. Roderick is really offloading onto Stephen. He's rambling. He's going into very fine detail about every single part. Roderick has held this inside him for so long, and this is his first opportunity where he's very openly talking about the night of the murder. He's not kind of etching round it. He's not hinting at anything. This is the first time he's able to openly speak about what he'd done to his parents. And he saw this as an opportunity to just get it all out, get it off of his chest. A forensic psychologist later spoke about Roderick and said how they believe that they thought Roderick likely found it very hard living with what he had done, that he had felt extremely guilty about his actions and it really affected him that he could see how his actions were affecting everyone around him, people that he genuinely cared about. This psychologist theorises that maybe in a way Roderick now confessing, he's believing that he's given his auntie Nan and uncle Stephen the answers 
that they desperately wanted because he would be helping them with their grief because they would no longer have their what, how, where, why questions hanging over their heads anymore. And to him, he believed this would be the first step in him earning their forgiveness. After Roderick finishes this complete confession, Stephen turns to him and asks why. Roderick replies, quote, you wouldn't understand because I don't understand. Officers in the other room cannot believe what they are hearing. The person they have suspected for almost five years is now fully confessing to this murder. Not even in a like, yeah, I did a type where he is going into fine details. He is going into details that are not known to the public. And he mentions an accomplice, so straight away the officers believe he's talking about Mark. However, the officers did have one problem. That was that this confession was happening in Scotland, a whole other country. And because they aren't Scottish police, they didn't have the authority to arrest Roderick. So they had to discreetly follow him. They followed him in an unmarked car and they planned to pull him over and arrest him as soon as he passed over the English border. They followed Roderick basically from the moment he left the Dunkeld House Hotel. They always kept a couple of cars behind. They tried to be really discreet as to not raise any suspicions but Roderick wasn't stupid he would sporadically change different lanes he would slow down and speed up at random times and he was noting that there was a specific car that was doing everything he was doing he had sussed them out and once he had sussed them out he gave them the slip he went off last minute at a completely random roundabout and he was gone they couldn't find him this man had just confessed to a horrific double murder and police have lost him. Roderick had somehow managed to get all the way to France under the radar from police who by now are doing everything they can to track him down. They were using helicopters, nimrods, they were contacting different hiring agencies, you know, like car hire or boat hire to see if Roderick had used any of their services, which he hadn't. Once in France, Roderick jumped straight onto his yacht and sailed off. And for a full week, it was almost as if he dropped off the face of the earth. No one could find him. The beginning of the end of this international manhunt for Roderick Newell was when his yacht was spotted in Gibraltar. This was police's most recent lead and they knew they couldn't let him slip away again. He could go anywhere. If they lost him now, they may never ever find him again. He had his own boat, so his own means to get around and he had plenty of money to fly under the radar and to disappear if he wanted to so there was absolutely a matter of urgency for police to find him they enlisted the help of the royal navy and they hunted roderick down finding him two days later he was 150 miles southwest of gibraltar he was actually quite close to morocco when they spotted him they couldn't go over to his yacht and arrest him on there of bring him to their boat with force. They had to be very sneaky and sort of trick him into coming onto their vessel. So what they'd done is the crew on board acted completely ignorant and completely oblivious to the fact that Roderick was a wanted man, a very notable wanted man at this point. They had communicated with him somehow and told him that this was just a random drugs control stop and that could he come over to the boat so they could do whatever they do at those stops. He agreed and he rode over to their boat and on that day, the 5th of August 1992, Roderick Newell was arrested for the murder of his parents, Nicholas and Elizabeth Newell. Mark was later arrested by the French police at his Paris apartment as it was suspected that he was the accomplice that Roderick was referring to. When he was arrested, they did do a little search around his apartment and they found something strange. So remember I said earlier on when Mark had took care of the bill for the whole family for Elizabeth's birthday meal at the Seacrest Hotel? They found the receipt for this perched up on the windowsill. Like what a random thing to keep hold of unless it was being kept as a trophy. Mark was extradited to Jersey. However, he was released on bail and was allowed to go back to Paris. Extradition of Roderick wasn't as easy. His solicitors were arguing to the Gibraltar courts that his confession tape should be deemed inadmissible. 
what his solicitors were arguing was that Roderick was basically interviewed or interrogated and they recognised that his uncle Stephen wasn't a part of the police force but that he was acting on behalf of them or as an extension of the police force in order to get something specific out of Roderick so did he ask leaning questions, did he push Roderick towards that who knows but then they also argued that if he was working on behalf of the police Roderick should have been cautioned prior to this interview and he should have been read his rights which included his right to silence and obviously he wasn't surprisingly the Gibraltar courts agreed and they told police that if they wanted Roderick extradited they had to bring new or more evidence. Detectives conducted a search of Roderick's yacht and it was from something in here that led them to his ex-girlfriend the Brazilian woman Helena Pador. They flew out to Brazil to talk to her to see if she knew anything and she did. She provided police with a lengthy statement where she said that Roderick had admitted to murdering his parents to her at least twice on two separate occasions. So the first time he had been reading a book to her, he'd read this very dramatic paragraph which seemingly triggered him somehow and after reading this he began crying to Helena saying, I'm a murderer, I'm a murderer, I'm a murderer. The second time, they were out on a date night, they went to see the film Cape Fear and coming out of this film, Roderick was, was triggered again and he started talking about the murder again. Helena said to Roderick that maybe he should speak to a therapist or a psychologist, psychiatrist, something like that, but he refused. He said he would much rather Helena help him get through this and that it was healthy to live in fear. So with this sworn statement provided by Helena, the Gibraltar courts allowed the extradition of Roderick. I know that I probably made that sound like it happened really fast, but it didn't. That took like 14 to 18 months. During his time in the Gibraltar prison, Roderick did try to commit suicide at least twice. On his flight back to Jersey, Roderick was cooperating with the police to an extent. I think by now he knew that the jig was up, he knew that the police knew that he was responsible and I guess he may have felt some sort of relief that he didn't have to hide and hold this in anymore. He was presented with a map of Jersey and handed a pen and was asked if he could pinpoint where he had buried his parents. Roderick sits for a moment and rolls the pen between his fingers. He looks down to the map and his face is described as being dark and full of despair as he places a single dot on the map, showing police that he had buried his parents in some woodland behind his childhood home at Crow's Nest. As soon as they landed in Jersey, Roderick was taken directly to that woodland. He agreed that he was going to help try and find the bodies as best as he could. When he arrived there, he actually asked one of the officers if he could run so that he could sort of get muscle memory and try and almost reenact that night as it would help him be more specific and help him kind of pinpoint exactly where his parents were buried. So handcuffed to another officer, Roderick and this man dashed up a hill until Roderick stopped, indicating that they were in the approximate area where Nicholas and Elizabeth lay. A team dug and dug and dug around the approximate area that Roderick had pointed out to them and on day three of the digging, the lead investigator started to wonder whether Roderick had had them on. Did he really want to help the police? Had he changed his mind while he was on the plane? Is that why he was looking at the map, rolling the pen between his fingers? Was he deciding his tactic, what he was going to do? Did he not want Elizabeth and Nicholas to be found? Because if they were found, he could never wiggle his way out of the murder charge. This, their bodies being found, would totally clarify his guilt without a shadow of doubt. On this third day, the lead investigator is sat at the command post when he looks up and he notices a change of atmosphere atmosphere where all the digging's going on. He stands and he then walks over and looks down into the hole and that is where he sees a human foot. Nicholas and Elizabeth have finally been found. Nicholas was found still wearing his full suit from the night of the birthday dinner including his dinner jacket and Elizabeth was found wearing only her nightie. Nicholas and Elizabeth's bodies were taken for post-mortem and formal identification. They were able to be positively ID'd by their dental records. Nicholas was found to have sustained eight separate wounds, six to the back of his head and two to the front. He was also found to have something called a femur barbitone in his liver and his stomach. 
Fema Barbitone is a very strong sedative, so that raises the question, was he drugged before his murder? Had Roderick laced his drink so that Nicholas was unable to fight back? But if that is true, then that rules out completely Roderick's story of snapping and seeing red because surely drugging their drink would show some sort of premeditation. Unless both of them could be true, had he drugged them with the intent of murdering them later? I don't know, I just thought of that. But there also could be the question, did Nicholas use Fame Barbatone himself? The pathologist also determined that some of Nicholas's wounds weren't consistent with being beaten with only a nunchuck. Some of them were consistent with a pickaxe being used as well. Remember, Roderick had bought a pickaxe when he went and spent over £100 in that hardware store. But then that brings the question of when was the pickaxe taken out of the red van? Was it taken out of the red van when he and Mark arrived at the bungalow? You know, when Nicholas and Elizabeth had gone out for a drink with their friends and Roderick and Mark showed up before they did. Did Roderick bring the stuff in then? But if he brought them in then, how did Mark didn't see? And if he did see, did he question it? So did Mark know? I can't really think of another opportunity when Roderick had the van and the bungalow was sort of empty for him to load all of that stuff in so that raises the question but then it also raises the question if there's two different weapons the nunchuck and the pickaxe does that mean two perpetrators? Elizabeth had sustained seven wounds all around her head and it was said that these wounds were consistent with being beaten with an instrument such as a rice flail as opposed to nunchucks. At St Helia Royal Court, 28-year-old Roderick Newell pled guilty to the murder of both of his parents, Nicholas Newell and Elizabeth Newell. At the court, part of Roderick's confession was read out by the detective inspector and it said in part, quote, I admit I killed my parents on the 11th of October 1987. My recollection is not completely clear after so much time. After Mark left, my parents and I continued talking and drinking in the sitting room. A heated argument developed in which many old wounds were reopened. It came to a head with my father and I standing face to face. I told him what I thought about him, things which I never said before. He pushed me and I fell, hitting my head on the dining room table. I found myself beside a box of my possessions I had sorted and removed from the attic earlier in the day. On top of this box was a pair of rice flails and martial arts weapons, which I grabbed and used to club my father. I remember him falling. The next memory was sitting on the floor in the hall. I got up and went to the sitting room and saw my father's body. I couldn't find a pulse. In a complete panic, I checked the kitchen and the bedroom where I found my mother's body. It triggered a memory of also attacking her. I could find no pulse again. I then realised I had murdered both of my parents. On the 8th of August 1994, Roderick Newell was handed two life sentences. At court, Mark Newell also pled guilty to assist in the crime and conspiracy to conceal it. For this, he was sentenced to eight years imprisonment. However, he only served around 20-ish months and was released in May 1996. After his release, he did have a little bit of a battle in order to inherit his parents' estate, such as the bungalow, the Spanish villa, and the yacht, and the rest of his inheritance. Something to do with the inheritance, I didn't understand it fully, but he did have a little bit of a battle fighting in order to be allowed this. He was allowed it in the end, though, because he didn't murder his parents, so he wasn't profiting off of his crime, if that makes sense. It's believed that Mark has been able to flip a lot of his parents' stuff and has been able to make millions. Shockingly, Roderick was released from prison in May 2007 after serving only 12 years. 12 years for a double murder and evading police for five years. He was described as being a model prisoner and some of the people who were incarcerated with him have since spoke out about Roderick and said that he was one of the most genuine people that they knew, that he was intelligent, articulate, kind and caring. While behind bars he participated in work experience. He worked at 
Chichester College and he managed to work his way up the ladder and became an IT lecturer. The principal of this college described Roderick's work as being exemplary and that he believes that Roderick should be allowed to get on with his life. Since his release he hasn't been allowed any access to any of his parents old assets at all because obviously he murdered them but it's believed that he and Mark have developed a very close bond and that Mark takes care of him. Today both men will be approaching their 60s. And that is today's case. I'm really interested in all what you all think about this case, what you think about Roderick's early release, what was his motive for murdering his parents, was he motivated by his inheritance or was it just out of resentment and anger? I'm also interested to know whether you all think that something such as good behaviour behind bars should affect a sentence and allow a prisoner to be released earlier. I'm also interested to know what you all think regarding Mark's involvement. Was he involved? Involved as little as he and Roderick said he was or was he involved more? Thank you all so much for sitting and listening with me today. If you have enjoyed today's video and you would like to watch another true crime case covered by me, I have plenty on my channel ready for you to all go and watch right now. If you're not already, please make sure to subscribe and to click the little bell button so that you'll be notified every time I upload a brand new true crime case. I also cover true crime in shorter form over on my TikTok account, which I'll leave a link for in the description box below. So well, yeah I'm going to leave today's video at that thank you all so much again for sitting and listening with me and I will see you all on my next one